Hello and welcome to another edition of Sparky Help. This time we're going to look at initial verification and more specifically this schedule of inspections. For obvious reasons this is quite a long one so I'll be broken up into parts as you can see below. So please like, share and subscribe to help me make these videos in the future. Many thanks. It basically consists of two sheets. We've basically got to fill these in and look at around the installation to decide whether it's good or bad. If we take a look at this, then let's look at the top section there. Schedule inspections for new installation work only. Remember, this can be for a new distribution board, a new circuit, or a completely new installation throughout. This is when we would actually issue one of these. This is the form that you should be using or some variation of it, but it will have the same information. What do we have to put on it? It's either a tick or an NA. There's no limitation on this. You've either got to see it and it's okay, or it isn't there and not required. That's basically what we've got to look at. So tick or NA on these sheets. Let's look at the first one. External condition of intake equipment. This is a visual inspection only. Remember, we didn't install this. This is what the electricity company have installed. So this is the meter and the tails and all of those bits and pieces. Obviously their side of it. So let's have a look at a particular incoming supply. On this one, we can see the meter, we can see the service head, we can see the incoming cable, system tails. We don't have a picture of uh, the meter on this particular occasion, but we can see it's sealed. It looks in reasonably good condition from what we can see. So from everything we can see on there, it all looks good. So service cable, that's in there. Service head, well, we can see there's the service cutout with the fuse on. That all looks in good condition. The earthing arrangement, we can see there is an earth in there and we can recognise that this is a TNCS. Meter tails, we have meter tails, uh, they are there, they seem to be of an adequate size without checking what the fuse is, but it says it, I'm guessing that's, we can see on there it says 100 amp on there, we just make the assumption that's what it is, otherwise we'll never actually get anything done. So we'll say that they look okay, remember this is visual only. Meter equipment, we don't have any, but obviously you would have some. Um, so that would go in there. The isolator, well that would depend whether you have one or not. Here is a picture of an incoming supply. We can see the service cutout. You can see partially the incoming cable at the bottom. You can see it's a 100 amp fuse. It says it on the side. There's no ceiling on it, but that, well, I'm not going to worry about that. It all looks in good condition. It's a TNCS again. We have the meter, but more importantly, we have a main switch being provided an isolator this isolator is provided by distributor network operator so it's their switch it's not as so it could be a tick it could be an na it depends whether the distributor network operator in your area decides to fit them or not so have a look the next one down, parallel or switched alternative source supply. And it says adequate arrangements where generating sets operate as a switched alternative to a public supply or adequate arrangements where generating sets operate in parallel. So alternative supply, so that's uh, a backup, basically, a generator backup of some description. The other one, the, it's running in parallel with, so in conjunction with, so in the main supply, and it could be feeding in as well. Uh, when you sort of first read this, you think generating sets, well, we think of a generator, petrol engine, diesel engine, that type of thing. But this is not true. If we look at what the regulations state, what a generating set, they consider any of the following. And I love the regs when they do this. It can be a combustion engine, turbines, electric motors, photovoltaics, so that's solar panels, electrochemical accumulators, that's batteries, or anything else. So anything else that provides power, whatever that may be, that would is considered a generating set. So if you've got them, solar panels or anything else in the installation, uh, depending whether it's uh, in parallel or an alternative, you would tick as appropriate, providing obviously it's okay, because that's the whole point of checking it. Um, most of the time though, I would suggest we're probably going to be NA and we'll base this on a typical domestic style installation if there is such thing as a typical Next one, ADS, automatic disconnection of supply. So this is going to take us through all the different pieces that you need to have in place and make sure they're adequate for the installation that you have just completed, hopefully. So the distributor's earthing arrangement, well, hopefully we have one. Um, we've just seen it on the meter head, so it's there. Um, if we just look at what that says, because we have to, it's conveniently they put the regulations in here, and these are the regulations that we refer to on these next few. 
so you can see distributed earthing arrangement 542.1.2.1 and 542.1.2.2 that's the top two on there and that's obviously TNS and TNCS and it's basically saying that an earth will prov be provided by the electricity company um, and it will be connected to your system so we're making sure we have got that so if it's a distributed earthing arrangement and it's a TNS or TNCS that's what you're looking for um, and you'd put a tick in the top one but the next one is for if it's a TT installation so installation earth electro because that's under the next regulations and that's for a TT or in the, if you happen to come across them an IT an isolated earth system and then you'd be ticking that one and you'd have your own earth electrode so more often than not I would say depending where you are obviously it's a TN system if it happens to be a TT, then obviously you'd put where the NA is, you'd swap those two round. Earthing conductor and connections, including accessibility. Well, earthing conductor is dependent on your earthing system, where it goes from and to. So it's from the MET, and as you can see on a TNS on the left-hand side, that goes to the sheath of the cable. Uh, that would be your earthing conductor. In a TNCS, the earthing conductor is from the MET, as we saw in the previous photos where it went to the neutral link in the service cutout, which is basically where it splits. And obviously in a TT, it would go to the uh, earthing electrode. So hopefully you would have that and it will be adequate size. And as it says, connections, including accessibility. So specifically a TT system, uh, the electrode is accessible for maintenance purposes. So hopefully that would be a tick. Main protected bonding conductors and connections, including accessibility. There's a, there's a theme here. It must be able to get to all these things, which is fairly generic for most of our equipment we tend to install. So main protected bonding, that's to water and gas and the likes, uh, whatever that happens to be. So any other extraneous conductive part, if we want to get technical on it. And therefore, we run it from the MET to the locations. So it's for the gas and the water, it's after the meter or stopcock uh, within 600 mil of it before any branch pipe work or as it enters the building uh, if you've got any other extraneous conductive parts it's just an accessible point for it so that's the only two that really get told where to go so if you have them it's the correct size depending on your earthing system it's sized against your incoming supply so typically it's going to be 10 mils to these so are they there and are they connecting as shown Provision of safety electrical earthing bonding labels at all appropriate locations. So all those locations you've just connected, have we got the safety electrical connection do not remove? If it's missing, then it needs correcting. So all of these things here, if you find something wrong with any of this, effectively what we're doing is we are creating a snagging list, either for yourself, uh, because you've missed it, you're, oh, I must go back and do that, or you're doing it for someone else and you're going to give them a snagging list. Uh, to correct before you can sign off the work. So hopefully they would be okay. RCDs provided for fault protection. Now that part takes a couple of regulations there, 411.4.204 and 411.5.3. If we look at those regulations, what we've got, um, and it's specifically this bit here really, it says one or more of the following types of protected devices shall be used. This is for TT installation. So if you've on the uh, installation earth electrode you've had a tick, the chances are you're going to be putting in an RCD. You don't need to put an RCD as this regulation here suggests. It says if you have to use the following and it is the former is being pre uh, preferred which is an RCD. But if you could guarantee your ZS or your ZE was low enough then you don't need to put an RCD in. But good luck on that one. So therefore, it's going to be an RCD that goes in there. And therefore, it's going in as a fault protection. Um, so all TT installations pretty much are going to have an RCD. Uh, the 411.4.204, what that bit is, that applies to TN systems uh, specifically. And it's if your ZS fails. So you can't meet your ZS for, for the protective device for a particular reason. So it's a really long run. So what you now do is you can now put in an RCD. And if you put in an RCD, as it suggests on here, then you can apply table 41.5, which is basically the 1667 ohms for a 30 milliamp RCD. Uh, so your ZS now goes up to that. What it does, there's a bit of a caveat there, that's fine, you can do that, you'll, you'll certainly meet your ZS, 
uh, for disconnection for automatic disconnection but it does say go look at chapter 43 because the dis the circuit still has to disconnect under overload conditions so line neutral obviously an rcd will not work on line neutral so it still needs to work on that so it puts the emphasis back on you to go and check and go and do a line neutral loop and make sure that still complies um, which you don't wouldn't normally do but it's making you check so that's where the information comes from it tells you to go look at this table if you put a 30 milliamp to make it comply it's 1667 um, and the higher up in the milliamp, the lower the value goes. But that's just, in comparison to what the ZSs are on the protective devices, these are really high. So it may well be an NA because it's not there for ADS reasons. In most cases, when we put them in a typical TN system, they're there for other reasons. Well, that's the end of this part. So please click on the next link and go to the next part to continue watching. Thank you very much.